welcome to applied coaching practices by uh, Peter Madison. So I'm glad that you all could join us today here. Well, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Okay, so applied coaching practices. So this, sh this should be an interesting little talk, I hope. Uh, we're going to run through uh, some of the things that I've learned in my own uh, professional coaching journey and how I've applied some of those to uh, my role, which is as a transformation consultant uh, and coach. So I, I'm one of these people who goes into organizations and helps them work out how to change, how to adopt new practices, new ways of working, new ways of thinking about uh, how to work together to produce greater and better outcomes. Uh, predominantly, I've been working in the technology sector, mostly in finance and uh, strangely loyalty marketing, the two areas I've spent most of my career in. And uh, yeah, so if without further ado, let's get into uh, some of the uh, topics that we'd like to go through today. So the agenda is going to break down roughly like this. Uh, what is We're going to go over what is coaching um, and what it isn't. Uh, run through what are good questions, the different types of questions that we could ask in coaching, uh, how that works and uh, what the importance of questions are. And we're going to talk through the different tools as well, some of the things that we can bring to the table. And there are a lot of tools, but I'm going to talk through two of the most common ones that uh, I found very useful um, from coaching that I very use daily with uh, the clients that I work with. And then we're going to wrap it up with a brief overview of uh, aspects, and they'll be available to answer any questions anybody has. So let's start with what is coaching. And, and the first thing that uh, I'm going to ask here is if people would like to um, provide some viewpoints as to what they think is coaching. And I put together a quick little survey here on uh, a Menti, if uh, you'd like to go there and um, start entering some information and see what feedback we get. And I have a couple of these uh, in the course of the slides um, and seeing if this works in the uh, context. Guiding others find their own way. Nice thing about Menti, you get the live feedback. Getting this cricket team riled up, that's definitely what coaching is about. Okay, so let's go back to our presentation here. The ICF, the International Coach Federation, which is one of the largest professional coaching bodies, uh, describes coaching like this. Partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional potential. So if this is the case, how does this compare to other service roles that uh, there are out there? So, and we have coaching, uh, but then what about the other roles that we have out there? So for example, consulting. Well, the difference between coaching, which focuses on setting goals and creating the outcomes, and consulting is that consulting uses the consultant's expertise. We're focusing on achieving a certain result. Uh, consultants come in and they provide recommendations and implement solutions. And uh, whereas coaching is focusing on getting the outcomes that are related personally to the uh, person, uh, to the things that the person is capable of doing. Uh, versus mentoring. Mentoring very much uses the mentor's knowledge and the mentor is providing advice and guidance and using the mentor's experience and expertise to help um, guide the uh, mentee. Uh, compared to training, well, training is the transferring of knowledge. And whereas we can use coaching uh, type practices within our training, really training is just how do I get knowledge from one person to somebody else? And there's an automatic assumption here of uh, I know more than you do, and which is why I'm providing this. Counseling, therapy. Uh, so coaching isn't counseling either. I mean, coaching uh, very much is focused on the positive outcomes, helping somebody grow, helping somebody find their inner strengths and ways of developing, whereas counseling is much more of the act of healing and dealing with dysfunction and other problems. And facilitation. Uh, well, facilitation works with the desired 
outcomes that you're trying to create from a group. So it's about creating an environment in which others can effectively produce those desired outcomes by the ways that they can actually uh, create the kind of uh, outcomes you're looking for from those groups. When we look at the role of an agile coach, we see that professional coaching is indeed one of the capabilities that we have in an agile coach. And there are lots and lots of um, the other things that the coach is supposed to do, many of which are the other professional services. Uh, but really, the focus here is on this professional coaching piece, where we're talking about how um, we use the professional coaching skills in in helping, I realized, in my camera. Uh, these professional coaching skills to help with agile transformation, DevOps transformation, and helping organizations uh, improve. So if we look at the flow of solutions-focused coaching, which is a form of professional coaching, it runs roughly like this. We start from this concept of coach position. Uh, and coach position is this idea that as a coach, you are not directly involved emotionally in the outcomes that are being looked to being achieved. It's almost a, in some ways, a meditative state. And uh, when coaching, you uh, you look to try and distance yourself from the questions and look at things purely from uh, listening and working out how do uh, how do I move things forward? How do I help um, the client? Next part is establishing rapport. And this is where we use things like softeners and backtracking and recapping and, and methods in order to uh, ensure that we're on the same page. And, th and this is absolutely critical. It's why we have to do this early to make sure that the person that we're working with um, is willing to open up and listen and, and share their experiences and thoughts. And very often we find that if you slip out of coach position and start to provide advice and guidance, and then you can very often break that rapport. And by breaking that rapport, it's, it's much harder to achieve the kinds of outcomes we're looking to through coaching. The next very critical part is this idea of initiating the contract. And the contract is something that's always stated in the positive. It's something that's going to be within the client's control, and it's going to be something that they are, is ecological to them, something that they can understand within their surroundings. It's when we establish the contract uh, that we lay out what we intend to get out of the coaching session. And if we're running coaching in just even a short conversation with somebody to help them overcome or do to dig deeper into a particular problem, this contract is uh, absolutely critical because it sets the groundwork for will we know whether we're successful or not. Uh, and we, this is one of the interesting parts we see here is that a lot of these practices and behaviors are very similar uh, to the ones that we use in agile coaching. We borrow these into the agile coaching world and we use them to help people learn these new practices and ways of uh, thinking. The next part is this concept of ensuring that you're working from the outcome frame. And the outcome frame is this idea that the contract that we've created is phrased in a positive manner in a way that we can uh, both you and the client and the, or the group that you're working with can understand how this uh, how success will be achieved. Um, and we've defined this in a solid way to understand what that looks like. And we're confirming the contract at this point. We're saying, is this what you want? If, if at the end of these 30 minutes that we're talking, if we achieve a couple of ways of moving you along in your agile journey, is that a good thing? Is that what you want out of this session? At uh, creating an experience, this is the part that comes next. And uh, as we go through some of the questions later on and some of the pieces around different tools that we can use and the types of questions, uh, this is we use those both in when we're initiating the contract, but also and especially in this creating the experience. And creating the experience is where we start to dig into what is the problem? What is 
the actual thing that we're looking to solve for you. If we want to get to that outcome, uh, we need to create an experience. And to create that experience, we need to bring a, a set of tools and capabilities and conversations to the table in order to be able to make that happen. And after we've created the uh, experience, um, we can now start to identify any action steps that uh, the client or the group might need. And this is where we break it down and say, what are those action steps? What are the things that we need to do in order to uh, achieve these outcomes that we're looking for? And most importantly, at this point, we ask, well, how might you commit to this? Uh, how are you going to hold yourself accountable to actually achieving these outcomes? If you want to improve how you understand uh, the running, sprint, uh, running your sprints, how might you commit to this? How might you uh, hold yourself accountable to making that happen? And then to wrap the session up, we ask questions around how is this of value to you? Um, uh, what do you understand now that is different from before? Uh, how has your experience changed? And finally, we celebrate the client. And these last two pieces, it's very similar to what we do from a retrospective, um, when we do retrospectives in, uh, in an agile manner where we, we ask the value, we ask, and, and what would you do better next time? Um, and celebrating the client saying, we appreciate you for showing up. This is another critical part of it, showing that we really appreciate you contributing to the conversation. So as we go through um, exploring and identifying contracts and uh, looking at what things we need to do to help people. We ask questions and coaches are very much known for asking questions uh, more than making directive statements. And so when we look at this, there are different types of questions, this concept of open and closed questions. And these make a huge difference to the way that we engage in conversation and the way that we interact with people. And open qu questions typically start with your how, where, who, when statements like uh, tell me about or explain more of that to me. Whereas a closed question is one that, will, that elicits either a yes or a no or just closes the coachee down. So if we take an example for, of this, we say something like, are you going to complete the task this week? Uh, this is a closed question. The answer is yes or no. And it's not really going to help us understand whether there are anything, any things which are holding them back from being able to do this. It's not giving any opportunity to explore deeper. So a better coaching question would be, well, what will it take to achieve this task this week? Which is an open-ended question that starts to open up this idea of, how might we learn about this? How might we uh, learn a bit more about um, what it's going to take to achieve this? So another example, uh, is this something you'd be willing to do? Is it yes or no? If somebody's committing, they're making a promise, you're, you're putting them on the spot to do this. Whereas if we ask, how committed are you to getting this done? We're much more being much more exploratory. We're asking and seeing how is somebody engaged? Are they engaged in this? Are they thinking about what it might take to do this? And there are graduations of open questions too. And some questions will elicit a dead, answer, dead end, even though that they have a, a how or a what at the beginning of it. For example, if you ask your kids, how was school today? Uh, it's not uncommon to get the answer of, well, it was okay. Whereas if you ask a question like, what was the best part of school for you today? This is a, a much more open, open question. This is a question that is going to elicit a deeper answer. It will create thought. You can't just say it was okay. You're going to have to think about, well, what was the best part? You're going to have to reflect. And this is a, a key part of what we're looking to do when we ask um, questions like this. There are lots of questions out there. And one area that's quite interesting uh, coming out of psychology is this concept of clean language. Uh, Mike Burroughs uses this very well in uh, his agenda shift methodology for helping with strategy and uh, transformation. And the clean language uh, 
is based out of uh, these nine questions that you see here. And this set of questions can be used to elicit a deeper inquiry into what's happening. Uh, and it uses the client's own language and plays it back to them in the form of questions uh, so that you can say, and then what happens? So if we ask uh, when we're looking to release a product, and then what happens? If we're looking to uh, create um, a new service for a customer, uh, and what kind of service is that for the customer? So th this clean language is a very, very powerful way of uh, asking questions that will help you explore and learn uh, more about what uh, a client is looking for. So I recommend reading up about this and using this in your uh, in your conversations with your uh, clients or your staff. And in terms of powerful questions, so coaching is about questions, but it's not solely about questions. And in fact, if you look at the criticality of the aspects of what we do in professional coaching, uh, questions aren't even the first thing that we need to concern ourselves with. The first thing we need to concern ourselves with is that building of rapport. If we don't have rapport with the coachee, if we don't have that um, interaction with them, that they are willing to open up, that they're willing to listen to what we're saying, without that rapport, and the maintaining of that rapport, it'll be very, very difficult to get them to start to think differently, to start to change the way that they they behave, to start to um, think about the kinds of questions that we're asking them. Um, asking the wrong questions at the wrong time can very easily help somebody um, to will start to shut down and not respond in the way that you expect them to. The second most critical part is listening. So as coaches, uh, we have to listen not just to the words that are being said, but to the tone they're being said in, to the silences between the words. Is there hesitation? And uh, do they, does the person sigh or do they seem agitated? Are they, and there are different levels of listening. We talk about three levels of listening. Um, and the, the first level is the, the superficial level that we generally do uh, uh, in sort of everyday conversation, second level of listening goes a little deeper where we start to pick up on these nuances. And the third level of listening, uh, we're really deeply listening. We're really listening for um, what is going on with the with the client? What is the going on with the person that I'm talking to? Um, what is uh, causing them to respond in the way that they are? And then questions are indeed very important, but Rapport and listening are actually far more important in the coaching conversation. So moving on to talk about some common tools that we use. So the first kind of common tool that I'm going to talk about and that is as if shifts. Um, and these are things that you can use in lots and lots of different ways um, throughout the, all of the conversations that you have. And I'm going to run through eight of them, and there are many more. Um, and some of these you are almost certainly using, even if you're not even realizing you're using. But uh, by by talking through it, you can start to realize that uh, I can use these consciously to elicit the, the types of responses, to inquire about uh, things in certain ways. So the first one is time. So an as-if shift in time is... For example, imagine it's six months from now. We've rolled out the product. Everything is incredible. The clients are really, really happy. We've delivered everything on time. Now, looking back from six months from now, what are the key things you did to get there? What obstacles did you run into? How did you overcome them? And so time gives you a, a wonderful opportunity to look at and explore um, what will it take to get there. We talk about values. And if we ask about the client's values, we can say, for example, if the client is talking about uh, the energy and the creativity, you could ask a question like, well, assume that energy and creativity continues to build momentum and grow. Uh, how does that benefit you and your colleagues? 
We're asking the client to shift perspectives, to think about things in a different way. Point of view shift. And th this one is very common, especially in uh, in Thoughtbound, because this is simply the, just suppose you were to take on the perspective of one of your potential customers. Look through their eyes. What would they ask of you? Put yourself in the other person's shoes. Next one is a system shift. Uh, and this one is interesting, especially uh, doing a lot of work in the DevOps space. It's and thinking about systems, systems thinking. So just suppose that you look at the whole company. Some areas are faster, some areas are slower, some areas are really excelling. Um, how does the overall system need to shift to move forward? What would you change? Where would you change it? So systems shift is, think, is taking a step back, looking at the entire system and starting to think about what could change in that system. The next one is information. Now information is great for people who are stuck in analysis paralysis where they're struggling to move forward, where they're uh, having difficulty taking that next step. And the, what's holding them back is, well, if I just had that another piece of information, if, uh, if you hear somebody saying, well, I've just got to do a bit more research or I'm not sure about that, uh, then you can ask them to simply, what if the research is done? What would your next steps be then? And sometimes that can just, just asking that question can help somebody move past that roadblock, move past the analysis paralysis to realize, well, actually, the next steps, I can do those right now. I don't need to go do any more research. I have all of the information that I need. I just needed to start to think about what I actually need to do next. The next one is amplifying the solution. Now, this one is around, suppose you get the project off the ground and you're accelerating. How worthwhile is that project now? What do you see? What's different? What, do you can, what can you do now that you've, you've got so much more than you had before? Uh, contract creation. Uh, and this is the contract similar to the coaching I was talking about earlier. This is if uh, you were to make an agreement to do this project, what would you be doing differently? And this is talking about yeah, you're intrinsically talking to somebody's, um, uh, they've made a promise. You're asking them to, if you made a promise to do this, what would that change about the way that you would approach this? What would you do differently? And then uh, last but not least out of these eight, uh, one of my favorites is the, uh, the doorway button. So imagine that there was an easy button on your desk. And you're, you're having a difficult day, you're trying to work your way forward, you press that easy button, what would you be doing differently? What would happen? Uh, another form of this is, imagine you had a magic wand and you could wave that magic wand and one thing would happen. What would that thing be? Uh, we use this question uh, frequently in consulting. It's one of the questions we always ask um, at the end where we, we go through, we dig, we learn, we, we, as we do assessments, we understand about how organizations are operating. Uh, it's important to ask this question at the end to say, well, what would you change if you could? And that, that really uh, helps bring out the thought process, helps get people to think about uh, what they might be able to do differently um, in their environments. I, I would say that uh, the, the time the magic wand question and the point of view are probably the ones that I end up using the most. And then the information one for when uh, we run into those people who are struggling with that information paralysis. So another critical tool that we use uh, is one called logical levels. Uh, and this is a great tool to help people uncover a, a deeper level to start to connect into uh, what's really underlying the problem. And when we're, we're where they've got a problem where they're looking at things from a superficial level and we're trying to get them to look underneath that, to look at the deeper problem, the getting to the why and the like what is really truly glows. And it runs like this. So 
we start with this idea of asking a question about where and when. So where might you uh, where might you go to get the information that you need in order to complete this? Um, when do you think you'll get it done? And this is very much about the environment. This is about uh, what's going on around you. Do I have the information I need to be able to uh, have this conversation? Uh, and it is really about that. The next question is around what? So what are you going to do? Um, where, what might be the right solution to this? And we're asking a question about behaviors. Here. We're talking about moving up from the environment that is around us and the, the, up to the behaviors that we're going to take in that environment. Next question comes, how? How are you going to get that done? And this is about capabilities, like looking at skills and ways of doing things. And as you see, as we move up the pyramid, these questions are getting deeper into um, and more complex in what possibly are the answers. However, most conversations really occur below this squiggly line here. Most conversations occur at this reasonably safe level where we're, we're comfortable with this. We're comfortable asking each other questions about where and when things might happen happen about what it is we might do and that how we're going to go about doing it. The problem is that uh, if we only stay at this level, we're never going to truly get to like what's actually underlying the way that we interact with each other. Why are we doing these things? In fact, that's next question. And, and specifically, uh, the question of why is that important? Why is this important to you? And this is a key question that we, we always ask at the start of a, uh, a coaching conversation is, why is this important? And we it's the only why question we really ask, because why is very much an aggressive word. It's, uh, it can be seen as, a, um, as being uh, aggressive in the sense of, why did you do that? <laughs> so is, it's not, it doesn't come across as nicely. But the question that we ask here is, why is that important to you? And this elicits um, the values that may underlie why somebody is doing a particular action. So if we've discovered, like, so how they're going to do it, when we're, why they're, what they're doing and where they're going to do it, we can now ask, like, well, why is it important to you that you do it that way? Why is it important to you that you uh, you have all of the um, the code up front? Why is it important to you that design is done this way? And, and that uh, this allows you to look in and dig underneath as to what are the values that are driving that? Why is this person um, wanting to do things in this particular way? Next up from values, we can start to ask questions like who and the the typical coaching question out of a more of a life coaching space would be uh, who do you become uh, however and th and this is related to identity and identity is critical because this is where we're starting to now tie back into who are you uh, when you behave in this manner and once people can open up to that level you can really truly um, start to understand more about uh, how these things relate to each other. However, if you ask your typical um, person in a company or off the street, like, uh, who do you become? Uh, they're probably going to look at you blankly with absolutely no idea what you're talking about. So a, a, another question that you can ask uh, in the identity space would be something more along the lines of, uh, what role do you play in creating this? And for example, if we're building products or creating value for a customer, it's like, what role would you play in creating this for a customer? And, and that I find that role question tends to land much better than the uh, who do you become question, which uh, can be difficult for people who aren't coaches or don't have a coaching background uh, to come in and actually really even approach. But once we move beyond even that, we can now start to ask the question around, well, if you play that role in creating this for the customer, who else benefits? What else happens when you do that? 
where could we then take this? And when we start to ask questions like this, we're starting to ask questions which are very much more related to what is the vision? What is the vision that we want to undertake? Where is it that we want to be able to go with this? And what, um, what do we want to be able to do with all of these things that we've learned? The interesting thing about logical levels is that once you've worked your way up here and you've uncovered that vision, you've uncovered the, the identities and the values and the, the critical parts, which what is actually underlying the decisions and the behaviors that we're taking, we can now work our way back down through this. And the interesting part here, too, is that as we work our way back down, we can continue to use the as-if shifts to explore more deeply. So what role would you play in creating for this customer? It could turn into um, six months from now, if the customer had this, what would they have? How would you have got that? What role would you have played in creating that for them? Um, and the, so this allows us to explore even more deeply into looking at what sort of things we need to ask in order to be able to help people dig more into what is really causing the, these behaviors. Why are we behaving this way? And this is especially critical in doing transformation because in order for us to help people think in a different way, we need to start to ask these kind of questions to understand what is causing us to behave in this manner so that we can start to think about what manner do we want to behave in? How do I want to be known? What role do I want to play in this? Uh, are we aligned? And so these are very, very critical parts. And, and as we work our way back down the pyramid, we can then start to use this to generate the, the action items we need to do. So if we start from this idea that um, uh, the value that we've created for the customer and we work our way through the roles that we've played for that, why it's important to us to having done that, the skills we brought to the table to make it happen, um, the, what we did with those skills um, to create that value and where we did it and when we were going to, de we delivered it to them. We can now tie that value that we created for them, the vision that we have of this directly to those actions that we're taking. And this allows us to now start to think about, if I take this action, if I start to perform this task in this particular manner, um, what does that uh, particularly do for me? What does that uh, create? So, so that's logical levels. And logical levels, um, I find uh, to be one of the key pieces that I use in a lot of, of conversations. Uh, even just being able to understand the differentiation uh, as you move above the line into deeper questions about how people are behaving. This can help people stop and think about um, why certain actions are being taken, uh, why certain behaviors are occurring. So I have another quick question for everybody here that having been through all the different things I've just presented. Um, it is another quick mentee. And this one is on uh, what words describe coaching for you now? So if you have to, uh, now that we've gone through all of the information, all of these questions, uh, what words would you use to describe um, coaching? Uh, has it differed now? Has it changed from... Uh, being about the uh, about the cricket team? Uh, is coaching something different for you now than it was before? I give people a chance to grab the uh, word cloud off that. Let's see where's uh Pr 
practical. I like that. Yes, building working relationships. Yeah, that's very much a, a key part of what uh, coaching can really, really help with. Awesome. I do like these word clouds and they build up. So I'm going to leave that uh, that building and you can uh, continue to put words in. It's fun that uh, practical came out as the most word. And what does, uh, I wonder what that does for people. And perhaps we can discuss uh, afterwards. So going back to... So for for me, when I talk about uh, coaching and wrapping this up, I think of it in, in terms of this uh, Socrates quote uh, about, I can't teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. Uh, it might be a few thousand years old, but I think it's a very good point that he's making here that we, we use coaching to help people um, open up their minds, to think about things differently, to... Uh, tr start to try and understand the problems that are facing them in a different way. And sometimes uh, we can really help people move forward. Uh, nearly always people already have ways of going about solving these ways of moving forward, understanding, even if that is looking at what other resources um, might be available to them. So, so hopefully the, the questions and the different tools and the pieces that I've been showing you today um, will help you think a little differently about um, how to use coaching and uh, hopefully soon it's going to be directly applicable to the way that you interact with others. So I'll leave you with, uh, with one more question as a, as a coach, which is how will you help somebody today? How will you take these bits of information and help somebody today? So with that, I'm going to wrap up. There's a quick feedback survey um, because there's, and I think that's actually left over from previous times of uh, these presentations. And my contact information is here. I'm always happy to connect with people and, uh, and chat. And uh, thank you very much. I think we're at the end of our uh, 45 minutes. Hey, Peter. Hi. Hi. So uh, if you have any questions for Peter, you can uh, put it in the Q&A section. You can ask, uh, ask him over there, which is, you can put it over there in the discussion bar, discuss discuss button which is there on the right hand side of the screen okay don't think we have any questions my i was so informative that everybody's uh <laughs> <laughs> so we'll wait for a minute and see if there are any questions And if anybody wants to talk about this, I think I'll be hanging out in the VIP room for that afterwards. Yes, sure. So.
So there was there is one question for you, Peter. Oh, okay. So in a large agile transformation, how would you get the support uh, you need for coaching in the first place? So th there's a couple of different ways. Uh, approaching it from an agile transformation. Uh, so typically within agile transformation, coaching is a key aspect of that change already because coaches uh, are often brought in to the agile transformation. Um, it's the the value of coaching is often sold in as the the ability to help people change the ability to help people through change um, so there's a lot of um, discussion around that side of it so depending on uh, how it's being introduced to the organization uh, will depend on the right way to go about uh, engaging with it uh, I've seen it brought in from a organizational change management perspective, uh, where which often comes in more through um, like the HR side of the house. Within agile transformations, they typically uh, have started within the technology part of the organization. Uh, and the value of uh, coaching uh, there is very much tends to be brought in, in with the transformation agents, with the uh, coaches who are doing that transformation. I hope that answered. I can dig more into that. It's a, it's a bit of a broad question around uh, transformation because in all of the transformations I've done, coaching has been front and center as a part of what's being brought in to make it happen. Um, in a corporate setting, seeking coaching, especially with colleagues, is taboo and perceived as weakness. Ah. Uh, so that this is an interesting concept, uh, and it might it might be cultural in in its nature. But there's this idea that um, every, everybody needs coaching in order to uh, to advance and grow. And coaching is a great way to start to explore things at a at a deeper level, even from a leadership perspective. Um, leaders uh, are providing coaching into other parts of the organization to help them uh, help their staff grow and to uh, develop new skills and start to learn how to behave in different ways. Uh, every coach I know, including myself, has coaches themselves um, because it helps to uh, – we can't, you can't coach yourself. You're looking in a mirror and trying to ask yourself deep questions is very difficult. So you need somebody who's going to be able to mirror things back to you. Uh, I think uh, we could point at um, a ton of material and online and in books and in other places that uh, shows the value of coaching and how it helps um, people uh, move forward and move past particular barriers. Um, so th there, there is a, especially in technology, I've seen there'd be a bit of a taboo around uh, coaching in that it's this, uh, this idea that, well, yeah, coaching is like life coaching and coaching is, um, you know, this uh, 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 more spiritual in nature uh, sometimes versus the more practical style of solutions focused coaching, which is what I've been presenting here today. So there is this this other way which can help break that taboo, I think, which is that coaching is not just this form of coaching over here. Coaching is also um, this other, there's other styles of coaching which are very much geared at organizational change and at being solutions focused and at helping people solve problems and framing it in that way to say that uh, we're using coaching to help people solve problems and to help overcome difficult uh, situations, I think is a very good way to do that. Um, and how can we measure the transformation matrix which we can use? <laughs> uh, well, th there's lots of different ways of uh, going about that. that. In terms of from a coaching perspective, um, how do we measure whether the coaching was effective? which I think may be what you mean um, in this case. So, and again, this is me being totally out of coach position, because, <laughs> um, but I, I, I suspect this might be what you mean, Kildee. Um, that the 
to measure the the transformation from a coaching perspective um, we can look at the the effectiveness of the the changes that we're getting into the organization are past the organization moving faster do we if we start to uh, look at the behaviors and the actions that are being taken. Are we seeing the right behaviors and actions being taken? Has Have behaviors changed? And we can measure that in a number of different ways. Uh, a, an interesting place to go look for that um, is out of something like, um, well, Kirkpatrick comes out of training, but his Kirkpatrick's um, uh, has these four levels of training evaluation, but what he's talking about after that is uh, a lot of pieces which are evaluating uh, coaching programs. So if you want to look for a, uh, for a book that's quite good on that and that, that will give you methods and themes to uh, measure the outcomes of transformation, that would be one place to look. Uh, I also, um, I mean, I tend to look at like what metrics are we measuring and what metrics are we creating? Do those metrics align to what the organization is looking for? If we start from a outcomes focus, we look at what outcomes we're looking to generate, what obstacles are going to prevent us getting there, what outcomes can we need to create along that way, uh, and what indicators can we use to tell whether or not we're hitting those outcomes. So once we start to look at those indicators, we can use those indicators to measure our progress. And coming out of it, and it, it really depends on then on what type of transformation, which part of the organization in technology and development of, uh, of technology, looking at things like Dora metrics um, are very good ways of doing that. And I, I'm happy to have a deeper conversation about the different ways of doing that and the different resources I could point you at. So by all means, uh, reach out and uh, I'll let you know the kind of process we go through to define that. Hope that answers your question. Okay, I think uh, we're wrapped up here now. Yeah. So thank you so much, Peter, for this session and sharing your experience with us today.